really heavy because there's a baby underneath it. You want that little extra adrenaline going through your body. And I would say it's bad all the other times. When you're in a board meeting, your physical safety is not in danger. So you need to be able to keep calm. When you're in a job interview, the, job inter the interviewer is not going to throw a spear at you from across the desk. And you're not going to need to be able to use that extra adrenaline and oxygen pumping through your muscles to dodge out of the way. But you want to keep control of your mental function so you can answer her or his questions as effectively as possible. So when your life is in danger, this is a good response. When's the last time anyone's life was in danger? Hopefully not recently. We're fortunate to live in a world where we don't have our physical safety threatened very often. But we do experience this reaction a lot, and it hurts us. Adrenaline goes through our body, oxygen utilized for this response, this life or death situation, something called the amygdala, which is a processing center in our brain, focuses on the one thing that is the threat to our safety, and we lose our ability to consider multiple variables. Duration varies. Let's talk about duration. How long does this last? Mm, wait a minute, didn't I have a duration thing? All right, let's come back to duration. Let me just talk about some of the brain chemistry that Daniel Goldman simplifies for us. When we see some, some dangerous thing and we go into this emotional hijack, Suppose we are a hiker, enjoying a nice spring or fall day in the outdoors, getting some fresh air. We're walking along and we see this big, scary snake. We see that snake visually. Very quickly, that message is sent to something called the visual thalamus, which tells us, oh, that's a snake. And then, as we process that rationally, that information goes to our cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex is the part of the brain where we think rationally. Has anyone heard the, anyone ever, have you ever heard someone say, oh, she or he is very cerebral? You're so cerebral. It means you think rationally. It's the brainy part of your brain where rational decisions are made. You make a rational decision about how you're going to approach that snake in front of you. You send that information to this processing center, which is called the amygdala. The amygdala says, okay, the best thing to do is step back slowly. That information is translated down to your spinal cord, your muscles. You walk back slowly from that snake. So that's what we hope happens. We see the snake. That information goes to the cerebral cortex, goes to the amygdala. All the instructions of how to handle that situation in the best way possible. Now, there's another part of our brain, you may have heard called the lizard brain, the more primitive brain, which works faster. It works faster than the cerebral cortex. In which case, this information about the snake does not go through the cerebral cortex. It's transferred immediately to the amygdala. And the amygdala sends instructions down the spinal cord of how to handle that dangerous situation. So there are pros and cons here. Let's talk about this shorter path, which happens much faster. Let's talk about the pluses and minuses of this. When would this reaction, going straight to the amygdala, be good? When would this reaction, going straight to the amygdala, be bad? Yeah. I feel like if you see it and just start screaming, or it may actually wrap the snake and attack you. So that may be a bad situation. OK. Yes, free. Route, you're probably not making a rational decision. Yes. And, yes. and that's probably not so good. You're skipping the rational part of your brain. And that's usually not good. And if you don't need the rational part of your brain, if you just need to run really, really fast, then it's a good thing. Or you need to lift something that's really, really heavy because the baby's suffocating, then maybe it's a good thing. But you do not want to skip the rational part of your brain. Now, if you do skip the rational part of your brain, it's not going to take you very long to realize you did something irrational. It's going to take you maybe a second, 30 seconds. Man, I really shouldn't have said F you to that person. That was a bad idea. So when I say this happens much faster, it 
milliseconds. This happens in, I don't know, one thousandth of a second, and this happens in one second. I, I'm just throwing those numbers out of, out of thin air, but it's something like that. So we want to engage our cerebral cortex. We do not want to go into this emotional hijack unless what? Your life is in danger. Thankfully, our life is rarely in danger. Duration of this emotional hijack has different parts. Immediately, you will see this threat, and you could be in an emotional hijack until the threat is resolved. Either you've run really far away from the snake, or you've recognized that this is not a life-threatening situation, and you start to calm down. Your compromised working memory, according to the Institute for Health and Human Potential, will be compromised for 18 minutes. Remember that concept I mentioned earlier? You lose your ability to consider multiple variables because your amygdala is so focused on the one thing that is posing this threat to your physical safety. This effect lasts 18 minutes according to the Institute for Health and Human Potential. So 18 minutes after the interview, you'll think, God, why didn't I say that this was the management experience I had? I forgot about that because I thought she was going to throw a spear at me. Physical toxicity, this adrenaline that goes through your body lasts several hours, three to four hours. At the end of the day, you may say, gosh, I need to go to the bar and get a drink because I'm still like, even though the threat is gone, even though that review is over, I still just have this feeling, this physical toxicity. And lastly, because I like being dramatic and putting forever, there is an aspect of emotional distress that can last forever. Right, if you have a really bad experience with the guys in the copy office and you spend the next 20 years not wanting to go down there and talk with them because you've never really acknowledged or figured out how you can communicate more effectively with them, then this doesn't go away. So we want to avoid this emotional hijack. Let me, think, let me go over a quick method of how you can think about avoiding emotional hijack. The triple B method for avoiding emotional hijack. Break the pattern, buy time, build context. Break the pattern. You have a physiological reaction going on where your amygdala says your life is in danger. Stop that pattern. Breathe. You'll hear it over and over again. It's a good thing to do. Breathing helps us by slowing down our heart rate decreasing the amount of adrenaline running through our body. There's a physiological reason to take some deep breaths. Stop. Right? If you're screaming because you see the snake, realize that that reaction is going on because the emotional hijack has been triggered. Stop whatever behavior you're doing. Right? When you stand up to say F you to the host, you may have a couple seconds. You may have a couple seconds to realize, okay, my muscles are all tense. Oh. I remember in emotional intelligence class when my muscles get all tense and when I stand up and when I say something, that means I'm going to do something irrational. Stop and try to get back into your rational brain. Buy time. You need some time. Maybe just a couple of seconds. If I'm in the middle of a speech and someone asks me a question that throws me off, I can take some time. It may be better than just giving an off-the-cuff answer because I'm nervous that I may not know or you think I'm, just, I'm unqualified because I don't have an answer ready for you right away. I can take a breath and say, let me think about that for a minute. That's a great question. I could also say, let me get back to you on that question. That is worthy of further analysis. Avoid making commitments. Say, let me process this. My first job as a manager, I said, I used that all the time. I said, let me think this through, and I'll get back to you. Let me, let me process that vacation request, and we'll figure it out. And lastly, build context. Is this a threat to your life? Or is this something that your cerebral brain is better suited to manage? Count backwards from 100 by 3. It's an interesting technique. 
It just takes a little bit of rational thought. Right, 197, 94, 91. Gets you in that cerebral brain. Just a little bit of challenge could buy you some time to think carefully and calm down. Determined threat, we talked about. Right, is this person going to jump across the desk and stab me with a knife? Or are they just challenging me professionally? In which case, I need all my mental faculties. Triple D method, break the pattern, by time build context. Okay, so how do we improve our emotional intelligence? Three ways. Analysis, which you've been doing. Techniques, I just showed you one technique, the triple B method for dealing with emotional hijack, and practice. We'll do more practice next time, where we'll think about some exercises that are designed to trigger an emotional hijack, and we'll think about how we can use some of the techniques that we'll finish going over today. Um, let's see, where do we want to go? I want to do some things with this self, this self awareness worksheet. Let's just start very, very briefly with some stuff on the self awareness worksheet, and then we will take a break in the midst of that. And then we will, in the second half of class, finish the emotional, the self-awareness worksheet. Okay, so for the self-awareness worksheet, the first thing I wanted to mention is maybe you could jot down very quickly some goals. So I'm going to explain these first two pages, and then we're going to take I'm going to ask you to take maybe five minutes to think about some answers, and then we're going to take a break, and then you're going to come back, take another five minutes, and then we're going to go over what this means to our analysis. So let's turn to actually the third page, which is the Emotional Hijack Trigger Worksheet. What I would like you to do is think about three, three times, three occasions, where you went into emotional hijack. And this was not the fight or flight because your life was in danger. This is what we're calling an emotional hijack. This meant you went into that reaction, but not because your life was in danger. Think about three times that happened. And then you're going to go through each of those three questions. The first is you're going to ask yourself, was there any threat to your physical well-being? And the answer to that is going to be no. It's just a reminder. Because if the answer to that is yes, then that's a whole different situation. And it was good that you went into that emotional hijack. Now, the next question, in what way did you feel threatened? Professionally, financially, socially? Now, just because your life was not in danger, that does not mean you were not threatened. There was a reason you got nervous. Your professional credibility may have been on the line. You thought you were going to lose a lot of money. You thought socially no one was going to want to talk to you as a result of this interaction. Think about the reason, the way you felt threatened. And then thirdly, think about the broad category of event. If you can quantify this somehow into a category. Was this a supervisor, man, supervisor, subordinate type of situation where you get nervous when you were talking to your manager? Was this a family situation? Was this some sort of financial discussion? As you reflect on these three times you went into an emotional hijack, how can you start to categorize things that put you in that state? And then and in terms of the previous worksheet, the goal worksheet, I'm not gonna have you fill it out now but I will tell you the reason I put that is because I want you to think of this in terms of accomplishing your goals. Just like Goldman teaches us emotional intelligence in terms of effective job performance, I want you to think about how these emotional hijack situations prevented you from accomplishing your goals. So whatever you were trying to accomplish, give some thought to how this emotional hijack prevented you from accomplishing that or led to difficulties in it. Uh, so that's just why I put that on. We're running a little behind, so 
you know, you don't need to fill out your goals too thoroughly. What I do want you to do is think about these three times you went into an emotional hijack situation and think about the three questions associated with each. And just if you could, let's, let's remain seated and as questions come up, just fire them out. Let's, let's take about three, four minutes where there's not a lot of chaos with people running around the room. Uh, and then I'll give you a full healthy break time after that. So take, take a couple minutes to come up with three, three situations. Keep them in the back of your head and realize that the reason why emotional intelligence helps us is because it will help you accomplish those once you recognize. this exercise making sense? Does everyone think they'll be able to come up with three situations where your life was not actually in danger, but you went into this emotional hijack? And you can ruminate a little bit on what category you put that into. Any questions about this? Okay. So, is there a time at work where you got really stressed out? Yeah. Tell me about it. Mind you, your most painful moments of work. Yeah, but it wasn't the, it was, it wasn't the flat, flat, um, flat or freeze kind of response that I had. Okay. Um, is any emotion that, sorry, is any event that triggers a strong emotion, like, is that what you call it? Well, uh, I mean, there was a strong emotion triggered, but I wouldn't say it went to the extent of. Okay, okay. Now, the reason I asked you to explain it is it may not have been something that happened in a split second. It may have been something that stressed you out for a couple of hours. And while that was going on, maybe you were tempted to write a nasty email. Maybe you were tempted to say, I'm just going to give up with this job. Maybe there's something we could find there. Um, I don't know, maybe you could think of presentation you gave? Uh, you put it in that context, that's a big problem. Okay, great. All right, so good. Let's uh, give you a couple minutes to finish that and then take your break for 10 minutes. So let's meet back here at 2.35 and we'll start the second half of the class. Like an ongoing kind of situation?
That's good. Uh, and maybe if there's a specific, specific situation where someone would have been a great uh, uh, professional colleague where you should have talked to them. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm new and I'm nervous. Yeah, I so I, I think the most thing I get by about approaching someone to yeah. yeah. ask for a job in person. Okay, so you just were kind of in this in this in this state which was ultimately detrimental to your career. I think that's a great one.
question given to me about like, should I expand the planes, like a total out of blue, because I never prepared for this. I prepared for behavior questions, I prepared for financial questions, but now like such a hypothetical question. So I feel like I've been going back and forth forward with the only words I know, like NPV and cash flow discounts, like, uh, like for a couple minutes. And then once I got out of the office, when I was driving home, I said, I mean, should I have said this and that and that? I started like, listening things I could, you know, answer the question. Okay, so they asked you a question that was not related to finance? It's, real, it's not what I prepared, it's finance, but okay. it's more like a hypothetic, you give you a case and you try to answer it. So I wasn't prepared for the situation. I was more like knowledge-based facts thing. Great example. So you were asked a question uh, that you weren't, that you hadn't specifically studied for. Right. So a number of interesting things going on there. Remember we mentioned this idea of working memory being compromised for 18 minutes? 18 minutes when she's driving home, she realizes, oh, I didn't realize that point A could connect with B and C, and that would have been the way to answer that question. Right. So in terms of the category, it might have been a question that you weren't prepared for, threw you off. But I also feel it's because the interview, the pressure gets you there, and if you probably, during the session, you probably will be thinking more thoroughly. Okay, okay, so you know multiple things, just by filling out that worksheet. One, you know that interviewer interviews tend to stress you out, and they put you in a situation, specifically sometimes, where if you get asked a question that you haven't specifically prepared for, that might put you in a difficult emotional state. So you need to think about, instead of saying, I don't know the answer, or instead of whatever you did, taking a breath, break the pattern, buy time, build the context. Other examples. Um, before I came to this program, you know, I was in China, I had to quit my job, but it's not that easy because I had to ask my boss to uh, sign the signature on the agreement in China. But unfortunately, my boss was on the business travel uh, for maybe a couple of weeks, but I've already bought for me. Uh, my flight uh, ticket and I rent my apartment here. So, you know, maybe uh, I have to delay all my plans. Something like that. So I'm a very worried about if okay. my boss can now, you know, go back and uh, and sign on that uh, agreement. Maybe everything. Is good. Oh, okay. Okay. So when you found out that that your their approval may have been jeopardized. Mm -hmm. you, you went into an emotional hijack. Right. Okay, so this is, how do we categorize that event? Work with me. How do we categorize, what we've done, I think, I like the first two examples. We've got categories of events where you can be aware of. You can say, all right, this is a situation where I need to take a breath. Use the triple B method to avoid emotional hijack. How do we categorize this, this event? problems, yeah. logistics. It also has to do with, with patience and flexibility as well. Maybe, oh, I had this plan all worked out, and all of a sudden there's this wrench. I need to be patient, resilient, have some flexibility. So, Isn't this also something related to not having things under her control? No. Okay. She couldn't control his travel. She couldn't control um, when it's going to be signed. Things like that, it's out of her control. Yes, so we recognize that it's out of our control. Maybe things that are out of your control make you nervous? Right. Can we say that? Let's keep chewing on this one and maybe come back to it. All right, what else? Yeah, I did this where I was given a project that the time limit was shorter than usual, and also I didn't know what this was. Like, I haven't done anything like, like that before. Perfect. All right, let me stop you there and then hear a little bit more details. All right, so Jerry's got time limit shorter than he's used to and unknown stuff yeah. or just um, tasks that you haven't yeah. completed before. Yeah. So those are two things that might trigger an emotional hijack. Yeah. So what are you going to do if I throw something at you and say, Jerry, I want this done in two days and you know it's going to take a week and it's something you've never done before? Well, first I would uh, 
sometimes they just may imagine, maybe I just tell them that, you know, that it takes a week. Or maybe negotiate. Okay, all right, well, maybe the first well, thing I do help. is use the triple B method to avoid an emotional hijack. Yeah. Take yeah. breaths. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. So, okay, let me take a breath. Let me buy some time before I negotiate with this manager. Yeah. All right, and let me think of the most rational way to explain to this manager that it's going to take a week rather than two days. Or asking for additional help from other people. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'd like that we're able to categorize that, and that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Something shorter time period puts you in emotional hygiene. Other, other things, what else? Great. So um, I had a situation where it was a time-sensitive um, uh, project, and halfway through my, so me and my manager were working very closely on the project, and halfway through the project, what we worked on, um, suddenly my manager comes to me and says that, in conversation with his manager today, he figured out that this is not the way we're going to take, and we're going to go a different route. And which means the all the work that we have done so far is completely straight out. Okay. And so I really have to solve that in, and it wasn't really the ideal situation. I know I have another maybe you know few weeks to finish up the project, otherwise it's going to look bad on me. But then um, I was obviously happy with the way it was handled. What, okay, so so um, what did you do when you found out? Did you, or what were you tempted to do? Because we probably managed it pretty well. Right. So I mean, at that point, I obviously um, I had to solve that in, and then I wasn't happy. But then I to make the best use of the rest of the time. We had to sit down together again. So at this point, that you need to decide what is the clear direction. Okay. And so we took it. So, so when you, you sat down with this person, was there some tension there? So I knew that when I got, got a call early in the morning, uh -huh. um, or right when I went to work, I was at a different uh, meeting, and then I got this, that, uh, can you call me for a few minutes? I said, I'll be back within such and such time, but if it's an urgent, I can call you. He said, yeah, just give me a call for a few minutes. And I knew that there was something important that he wants to discuss with me. And at that okay. point, he said he apologized that he didn't know what was the um, correct way of taking it okay. um, forward. But then um, only today he came to know. And he knew that it would have a big implication on my completion of the but, project. But, 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 uh, what, I, what I'm digging for, is there anything that you did that was counterproductive? And I feel like in this situation, it sounds like something you handled very, very well, even though it was a pain. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was. Um, but, but, but the value here is, what did you do that was counterproductive, and how can you think about not doing that next mm -hmm, step? Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't know. At that point, probably, you know, I don't know if my, um, if I had shown my emotions that I was not, not happy, but probably, you know, he got the message from whatever um, when I was sitting down with him. That you were mad? Well, not mad, but probably not about the happiest situation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It sounds, it sounds like that was a successfully managed situation. Sure. But also, uh, what you could learn from it from our, the EQ standpoint is yeah. when you put a lot of work into something and then someone just erases that somehow because of some sort of change, <laughs> that's a situation that can be prone to an emotional hijack. So when that sort of change happens, make sure you're not around any sharp objects. <laughs> or use the triple B method to just think carefully. Okay, okay. Other? Other? Johnny? Got anything for us? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. Josh, you got, you got something, right, Josh? Uh, I guess I don't know exactly if this uh, fits, but I, the first time I was uh, in front of a panel of judges, uh, I, uh, they started a question, and I knew that I was going to have to answer questions about the, what I was presenting to them. Uh, but they started to ask increasingly specific questions, and then I uh, flubbed a couple of references into a layer of what specific pages and things were on, and I started to get really anxious about it and everything kind of snowballed from there in terms of, uh, you know, my, my thought process. It wasn't until they, I got a break uh, because I started to ask the uh, opposing counsel some questions that I was able to kind of reset myself and uh, find 
of all the references that I was trying to make where they actually were. And, you know, okay. You know. Great, great. All right, so how do we broadly categorize that event? And, and, and I might say it's not necessarily talking to judges. I think there's something broader you can put in that. Anyone want to help us out? So it's the category of event that may have caused an emotional hijack. Maybe it would be specific questions. It also might be when you made a mistake. So when you made a mistake that had to do with your professional credibility, was that what sent things into? Yeah, I think that was uh, you know kind of the, the, the quicksand feeling started there. sympathize with that, right? If you're in an interview, you're in some sort of presentation, and you say something where immediately in your head goes up, oh my god, that was wrong, or maybe they maybe they know it was wrong and they're judging me, that, that can be a difficult situation. Alright, so it's too bad that that happened, but when you've done some analysis, you might draw your attention to the fact that when that happens, you don't want to create that quicksand feeling and make it even worse. You want to do something to let yourself reset by talk to opposing counsel, counsel, ask a question that gives you a moment to breathe, ask the students a question. And this sounds like something that I've experienced before. And one way to decrease my anxiety when I feel like I got off course and said something wrong is engage one of the participants in the workshop I'm conducting or ask a student a question. Ask a student a hey, question. I mean, I get nervous up here sometimes. But sometimes when I ask you questions, it's just because I want a little bit of a chance to reflect, collect my thoughts, think about where I am. So I love the way we were able to quantify that. There's a specific category that, yeah, it's too bad it happened, but it could lead to something worse if you don't acknowledge it. All right, what do you, what do you come up with? Like, well, out of the specifically want to share what I came up with. <laughs> It was bad. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't bad. It was just personal. Mm -hmm. but, but afterwards, I was just looking at them, and I realized all the things that triggered it was like, well, all the three were, were instances where I got a phone call or, or an email that, and I found out some information. OK, so you found out information that was upsetting. Yeah. Uh, so how, how would you broadly describe the categories? Was it? Uh, information that threatened you financially? Was it information that undermined all your work you just done over the past three weeks, like pre-emission? Was it information that you had done something wrong and then you felt like it was going to create a quicksand? Um, let's just say socially. Okay. So, oh, is, did you done something wrong socially? That you've been judged socially? Being judged socially, yeah. Okay, so you've been being judged socially. And we talked about this with anxiety when giving a presentation. We get nervous because we're being judged. Maybe professionally, maybe socially, because no one's going to want to hang out with us. And that's good information. But think about that's something that can put you in an emotional hijack. So you don't want to make it worse and stand up at the party and say, F you, I'm out of here. You want to realize, okay, I'm a little tense. Let me just take a breath and use the triple B method. All right, great. So, the most important part to that exercise, I think, is this broad category of events. How can you understand that there are certain categories of events, certain relationships, certain environments that make you more prone to emotional hijack? And think about what you can do reach an effective resolution to that. So that brings us to the next two pages on the self-assessment worksheet. One is the potentially dangerous environment, and the next one is the potentially dangerous relationship. So let's think about the three examples you came up with in the first exercise, and think about what sort of environments might be dangerous in terms of an emotional hijack for you. 
in some of the environments I heard were job interviews. Uh, do we hear any other environments? I know we heard some different difficult relationships. We heard about relationships with a new boss. We heard about relationships with an audience who might be judging us. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, depends on how we quantify this. But yeah. But let's think about how we can put those three events into a potentially dangerous environment, potentially dangerous relationship. And let's think about three things with each of those environments or relationships. One, behavioral limitations. What happens to your behavior because you go into emotional hijack? I heard, I don't think of the right answer, even if I know the right answer from Yanni. I heard a quick sand feeling from Josh. I heard lack of rational thinking from Vanessa. The next question, what sort of warning signs do we get when we're in this dangerous situation or in this dangerous relationship? Is there something that happens before we stand up and say, I quit? that can cue us to something bad is coming. Heart rate increases, feeling of social judgment, feeling of quicksand. You'll recognize that quicksand feeling when it comes again. You're like, oh, this is happening. So instead of saying something to make it worse, I'm gonna do what I did last time to reset. And that brings us to the third point, positive actions. What should we do instead? standing up and say, I quit. So with these next two, we're thinking about these broad categories of events that we got in the first exercise. And how does that fit into potentially dangerous environments and potentially dangerous relationships? How does it limit, in each of those, think of the three things. How does that limit our behavior? What are the warning signs that will tip me off? An emotional hijack is going to lead me into a counterproductive action. And what should we do instead of positive actions? So take a couple minutes to try to collect those. And we'll discuss the same way. Because this is the takeaway. What should we do instead of standing up and say, I quit?
we coming on there? Just need some more time? Ready to start a little discussion? So the more we can quantify what's happening, how, and when, and why, the more effectively we'll be able to use this stuff. What do we got for potentially dangerous relationships? Relationships like with other people. Oh, my thought on that. I love like environment. Oh, okay, fine. fine. We can skip that into environment. Do you need some more? Well, let's let's discuss for a minute. And see what we have so far. And I'll give you a few more minutes if necessary. This is one of the the kind of thing I would definitely encourage you to continue thinking about after this class. But while it's fresh in your mind, while we have a minute to discuss it with each other, this is the kind of analysis where it's helpful just to do it get a little bit done before it completely loses your, your focus is on something else. So what do we get for potentially dangerous environments? Yeah? I thought about relationships. Oh, relationships. <laughs> Sorry, all right. So we've got a dangerous relationship. Yeah? Uh, I'm thinking about, let's say I have with, uh, with my coworker, and I'm thinking about how I supervise something morally that I don't agree with what it's doing. Okay, so it's a relationship with an immoral... Like, immoral supervisor. Supervisor, okay. Immoral supervisor. Okay, so, so hopefully you won't have to encounter that too much. Hopefully it's a situation that you could distance yourself from and or call the SEC and or... I don't think the SEC will care about that situation, <laughs> but what I found out is my working environment actually is not the only case uh, as a favorite company I work for is a similar case that actually make me even more frustrated that the thing I feel important and I think it was not told very much by the firm. So I think my behavior limitation is or I start I stop performing and I kind of look for a way out. Okay, we're still talking about the immoral supervisor? Right. Yeah, after the uh, after figure out it's not Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So, so this is an interesting. This is an immoral supervisor 